I will talk about dark matter simulations and at the end of it, what's uh, about the connection to stellar halos. So first I'll talk about substructure and density profiles today, by vertex zero, and then a bit about how do we get there, how do these st structures form. And in the end, I will have a few slides about ongoing work trying to connect these dark matter simulations to the stellar halo. Just a quick one slide summary of what we know and do not know about dark matter at the moment. Uh, of course, Dorf, by mentioning that it was first uh, seen by Chris Zwicky in the 1930s, he looked at the coma cluster and he seen that the one side velocity dispersions of these galaxies are really high. To, in order for this system to remain bound, they need to be much more mass than what you see in the stars. Of course, you didn't know about all the gas, all the hot gas here, but we now know that there's a lot of mass in the hot gas, and then even more mass in a, some non baryonic dark matter in this cluster. And since then, we got evidence from a variety of observations on a variety of scales, like galaxy rotation curves, X-rays, kinematics of stellar halos, kinematics also of satellite galaxies and global clusters, I mean global cluster systems here, not the global clusters themselves. Then the dwarf galaxy internal dispersions tell us that they are dominated by dark matter, and strong deep lensing tells us about the mass distribution, and we always need a dark matter component there too. And so nowadays we end up with this uh, epoch, in this epoch of sort of precision cosmology, where we have pretty accurate probes, especially the CMB large shape structure, also the type 1A supernova and big by nuclear synthesis, all of them are perfectly consistent with uh, lambda CDM model. In, with, in this model, the dark matter is, is cold, or at least it's not very cold. It could be cold. Yeah, but lambda alpha for it tells us that there's structures. <laughs> Yeah, so the Lyman Alpha Forest tells us that the, there is structures on practically all the scales that the baryons at this time are able to probe. So the dark matter can be very warm. Uh, it would also be a problem to have enough sources in the early universe to reionize re the gas if there's no power on, on the small enough scales. So we end up with a, with a picture where 83% like of the clustering matter is in some non non-baryonic, uh, relatively cold, dark component, the nature of which is still completely unknown. So on the microscopic scale, we don't know what it is. But since we know that it is relatively cold, we can still simulate its clustering. And of course, the hope is that simulating its clustering will help us in the end understand what the dark matter really is and help in the various direct and indirect detection efforts that are going on. So our approach to simulating structure formation is so-called collisionless or pure end body or dark matter only simulations. So the big approximation here is that we just treat all of the omega m like dark matter. So we ignore that there's so like one sixth of this is actually baryons. We just treat everything like collisionless dark matter, which is of course a bad approximation near large galaxies and, and inside large galaxies, but it's okay for dark matter dominated systems like dwarfs. And of course it's fine on even smaller scales where the halos are thought to be completely dark. So there's only dark matter practically in there. The advantage of this sim simplification is that the physics is just gravity. It's very easy to, well, it's relatively easy to simulate. You get good scaling. You can run your codes on very large numbers of CPUs efficiently. And essentially, you, you can reach very high resolution. And you don't have any free parameters in these simulations, too, because we know the initial conditions pretty well, thanks to mostly the CMB and the other probes I mentioned before. 
Uh, so it's a, it's a well-posed problem. It's, of course, an idealized problem. And our goal is to get uh, an as accurate as possible solution to this idealized problem. The complementary approach to simulating structure formation is to do hydrodynamics, to include um, the, the gas physics, which is computationally much more expensive and much more challenging, of course. Uh, it's not trivial to implement gas physics. For example, the popular SVH technique and, and grid techniques often disagree, even in simple test cases. I'll, I'll show one on the next slide. Another problem is that you have many processes that are important for the energetics of the gas that happen very far below the scales that you are able to resolve when you simulate a galaxy. So by that I mean star formation, supernova, the, and the feedback from these processes. Maybe also AGNs, uh, like the black holes, and cosmic rays. These are all things that are important. So in this approach, one has to implement them somehow through subgrid physics, which introduces uncertain functions and parameters and uncertainty. When you say up above smaller scales, you mean the very tiniest halos way below the, the gene length of the gas? Here, the... the no. Okay, for gene oh, gas. Yeah, here, I mean, I mean way below this, like smaller than dwarf galaxies. You really should use only omega CDM, but only the, the CDM for those. And it does make a little bit of, some difference. That's true, that's true, yeah. We, our assumption is that all the, all of omega m forms part on structure formations, even on these s small scales, which below the genes mass is of course not right. So there, w the variants would not participate in structure formation, but would have some effect on, on, the, on the very smaller structures that we resolve here, that's true. Okay, so. So one example for why, why gas is, is very difficult to model is from, from this paper by Oscar Eggers and, and Ben Moore and many others. So that's a simple test case where you have a blob of cold gas, in a dense cold gas in a diffuse hot medium. And it, it, it travels th this way. And that's the time evolution in an SPH. Uh, simulation of this problem. Um, that's a grid uh, with ad adaptive metric find and an AMR simulation of the same simple toy mo s test problem. And in all the AMR runs they tried, as soon as they have reasonable resolution, you always have these instabilities developing here and the blob completely dissolves. Whereas in SPH, it doesn't happen at all. And it didn't happen in, in various popular SPH implementations and also increasing resolution would not help. So it's just, it's, SPH is somewhat unstable if you have these uh, large differences, be large inhomogeneous in the, part, in the particle distribution. How long to simulate this relative to the couple of atoms of red hairs that uh, time scale there of this problem? Oh uh, yeah, very long. So this is a couple of these time scales and these, these type of instabilities did form in the, in the AMR but not in the SPH. The problem is that there's some kind of gap forming here artificial, due to some artificial pressure at the boundary well, in the SPH. Yeah. Surface tension effect, there could yeah. be some relation of um, entropy in the SPH. Right. So, so, so they tried several SPH codes, several resolutions, and you get, you get this kind of gap, and these layers st stop communicating, and then it just does, it, it doesn't happen naturally in SPH, uh, whereas it does in, in what should happen, that happens only in the grid code. Uh, and this is a situation that's somewhat similar to run pressure stripping in, in galaxy formation. So that's an important Before effect. Correct. This one's correct. Yeah. Well, if you only do this in a pure hydrodynamic case, if you actually look in an MHD case, you get a different solution, right? Yeah, that's, that, it's more Which complicated is altogether. We have actually our galaxy forming into a magnetized field of magnetization. Yeah, that's of course neglecting magnetic fields altogether. So yeah, our, our one of our next projects is to redo some of the simulations I sh have shown with, with AMR. But it's, of course, very expensive. The, and it's co the requirements are huge in terms of memory and, and CPU time. So now back to the collisionless dark matter simulations that I mostly work on. They're, of course, approximations too. So um, 
the approximation gets better as uh, the number of particles that you use to sample these the density fields becomes larger. So that, that's illustrated here. Uh, it's the same object shown in density. Um, the resolution ranges from about 10,000 to about a million particles within the halo. And you obviously see that uh, just the large, so the larger scales are the same, so the sh roughly, roughly the shape, um, that's, that's the same. But all the smaller scale, like the substructures and the high density peaks in the inner part, they're only resolved if you have enough particles. And you see the same thing if you plot it in phase space density instead of density. So of course, the better this number of particles is, the, the larger this number is, the better. And so we're trying to just push this number as far as, as, as we can. And just a quick summary on the runs I did so far. It's like this is back in, in my thesis with Ben Moore and Joachim Stadl. I did clusters and galaxies with about 20, up to 25 million particles. And then later in, in Santa Cruz with Mike Kulin and Piero Madao, we did a similar number of particles, but on a very different mass scales, so subsolar mass system, simulated with enough particles to resolve its substructure. And in, in many respects, the substructure at this high redshift and very low mass scale is actually similar to the redshift zero substructure in a cluster. So CDM has structures on all scales. There are some differences because the power spectrum is different on the small scales. But substructure does survive within these type of micro halos. Uh, then, this was sort of the state of the art at, at this time. Then we made a, a jump to about 100 million particles in one halo in, in the first Vialaptia simulation. And last year we were able to go to half a, million, half a billion particles within the halo. And that's a simulation that uses over a billion particles in total. It took over one million CPU hours on one of the fastest computers in the, uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab. And one, another improvement besides the number of particles is that it, it uses a more physical uh, criterion to assign the individual time steps for the particles. I'll, I'll come back to that a bit later. So why do we spend all this CPU time and all this effort on resolving dark structures, which are yeah, just mostly dark and boring. So one motivation is indirect detection, especially GLAST. Its, uh, its launch date is now set for this Sunday. So it should, it should launch uh, around noon this Sunday from Cape Canaveral. So that's a, a gamma ray uh, space <coughs> telescope that will survey the entire sky several times per day. And it, if all goes well, it will start taking data in, in a few weeks after the calibration. So why gamma rays? So if the dark matter is a, a WIMP and it's, and it's its own antiparticle, it would annihilate when, it, when two particles meet. And it would produce a, a range of different particles and and it will also produce gamma rays. S a few of the events would directly go into, into a mononergetic uh, gamma ray, which is the same energy as the wind, but that's highly suppressed. So most of the, most of the gamma rays would actually be in a, uh, in a spectrum that's due to the subsequent, that's after the production of other particles that then decay into, give rise to the gamma rays. And because in uh, annihilation, the, the signal is proportional to the local density squared times the volume. And that's, that's something we can, of course, quickly, uh, easily measure in the simulation by just adding up the local density for each particle times the mass of this particle. Let's just sum that up. And when you do this, you actually see that it's dominated by clumpiness on small scales. So it's very important to take into account this small scale structuring predicted by CDM. Another way to indirectly detect dark matter is by l looking for the other particles that are produced in these annihilations with, for example, charged particles like uh, with positrons. 
they would not propagate as far through the galaxy, but they would have to be produced within a few kiloparsecs to be visible for satellites like Pamela or the future AMS experiment. And also blast will be sensitive to charged particles. <coughs> so the question is, uh, how is the dark matter distributed within a, about a kiloparsec around us? Is it just a smooth halo or is that also increased by local clumpiness? For direct detection in the laboratory, one wants to know the distribution even more locally, like on solar system scales. So what is the density probe by an experiment that goes around the sun in, in, in a year? Um, that's a very difficult question and still quite kind of open because this scale is, of course, far below the ones that we can resolve directly. Then more, re more relevant for astronomy are the connection of these dark halos to the satellite galaxies and also to the stellar halo. So because these type of systems are thought to be the building blocks of the stellar halo. Um, I'll talk a bit about that towards the end. So that, this will be a movie. Um, it's, just, it's a bit hard to see because of the light. Uh, it's good, at least it's not sunny. So it's, you'll see something. So that the simulation started at Redshift 50. Th this movie starts a bit later and it shows you the dark matter density square projected. And it's all in physical coordinates. So it's physical densities and physical positions. So at the beginning you see the expansion and then the inner parts turn around and quickly form the inner halo in a series of major mergers. And after, after now it's pretty quiet. And there's just a lot of smaller structures falling in and orbiting in and out of this system. Whereas now whereas the global mass distribution is pretty stationary uh, for most of the like, second half of this time. And now at Redshift Zero, we just zoom out and back in to sh show you the structure. So you see that a lot of, a lot of subhalos do survive this merging process, even in the inner part. So you have to look very, very far in the, in the very center to, to see a smooth region. And, and this smooth part is actually becoming smaller every time you increase the numerical resolution. So it's not, it's probably not real that there's this uh, smooth inner region. And wherever we have good resolution, we see clumps on, on many different scales. Now I'll show a similar movie. Uh, I just added an inset here that focuses on this object. It starts at Redshift 2 now, and that's about the time when, when this thing f first falls into the galactic halo. And you'll see, you also see here the density squared in projection, just a different color scale. And you'll see how this thing loses a lot of its mass, mostly from the outside. So the inner densities remi remain very high. So at every pericenter, you, you see it become much smaller. And this arrow points to the galactic center. And there's some tendency for this system to align its major axis towards the galactic center. The alignment is not perfect. So, this, so there's some kind of tidal effect tries to make this alignment. And especially at the pericenter, the passage is too fast. So this doesn't keep up. But if you look for this alignment in a statistical way over all substructures at redshift zero, you see a significant signal. So many subhalos will tend to point towards the galactic center with their major axis, which might be uh, a foreground for weak lensing. If you have galaxies in the same cluster and you, they would be aligned by that. So you'd have to exclude things that are at, si at similar redshift. It would also be they for- They are spinning though, right? Yeah, they're, they're, sp they're spinning, yeah. So they're so on their orbits, they tr try to remain okay. pointing towards the center. So the axis ratio is dominated by rotation? I think it isn't, like, it isn't just anisotropy in the... Uh, no, the individual thing does not spin. It's completely supported yeah. by random motion. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, like, you know, so for actual galaxies, that were for the thing with disks... Uh, disk galaxies, yes. That's, yeah. You might think that uh, the rotation uh, might be totally different. Yes, 
we don't know how this galaxy would be oriented in, in one of these systems. Right. That's, yeah, it's, it's, it's unclear how that would work. Um, maybe for, for dwarf elliptical, you might suspect that it would be aligned with the major, roughly with the shape of its potential. So for us, if we are, we are sort of in the very inner part here, observing uh, velocity dispersions of dwarfs along the line of sight, we're looking, for most of them, we're looking pretty <laughs> radially. So that's, that might be a bias, that we're mostly picking up the major axis of these systems. And when we assume spherical, we might overestimate the, the halo sizes for the, for the dwarfs. But uh, yeah, that's something we will have to quantify a bit more. So all these movies are available here on this, on this website. We also have the data available there. So what we have on, on this page is the tracks, the evolutionary tracks of all systems. So we know their, their positions and sizes at all times. So we have, you can, you can, you can plot these tracks and you can, like, uh, if you want to assign with same analytic methods, assign light or, or dwarf galaxy properties to them. So that's all available in there. And so that was for the first real lucky run. And now we have the, just finished, end of last year, we finished the second run in this series. And that's about five times more particles. So that's now a billion particles. Uh, that shows the galactic halo from the center out to 400 kiloparsecs. And it looks similar to what I've shown before. Just, of course, we have more particles, so we're able to see smaller structures. So all these small points are resolved subhalos. It's not just, not just particles. So the mass scale here is, is like sort of Milky Way mass? Yes, yeah, so that's a Milky Way size halo, 10 to 12, two times 10 to 12, actually. Um, the video radius is about here, you know, around 300 kiloparsecs. And now this is, uh, you can barely see it, this white box is a 40 kiloparsec cube, which is blown up here in this inset. Now the inset is not colored by density anymore, but it's colored by phase-based density, which has two effects. It, it, it makes the dark matter subhalo is much more visible because they're both dense and they're also very low velocity dispersion systems. So their phase space density is huge. So all these red points are subhalos or centers of subhalos. And it's all the same color. So the red is, a, is essentially just the highest phase space density that we can resolve in these kind of runs. And that's also how we find them in the, in the code. We just look for the peaks in phase space density. So essentially we link all the red stuff together and then look around these centers of what, what belongs to them. The second thing, which is a bit hard to see, are these kind of bluish uh, stream things, which is debris that's stripped away from these dark matter halos. The density on, on one of these streams, so if you go on one, one to the, onto one of these streams and look on how many of the local particles belong to the streams, it's only about one in a hundred. So the, one stream contributes pretty little to the local density, but since its dispersion is about a factor of 10 lower than the local dispersion, you still see them in phase-based density. Because phase-based density is roughly density divided by dispersion to the third. So these are these, these bluish features, which are sort of dark matter streams, and they're somewhat related to the stellar streams that we observe in, in the halo around the Milky Way. So is that projected? Or I should have shown this one. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. That's that's in projection, but the number of streams, but you know, small radius actually physically at small radius, is, is it like much less or? Um, the number is much larger at smaller radii because the uh, dynamical times are shorter, S and the number of building blocks contributing to the inner parts are larger too. But the number of visible streams is smaller because there's, if you go to the inner part, at each point you have a superposition of thousands or. No, millions of streams probably. If you go to further out, you still have separate positions of hundreds of streams, but they have some chance that there's one uh, young recent stream that's visible. Yeah. So are they just remnants of the Kahiro uh, streams? In phase space, it should be clear to see the volume-like structure. Right? <coughs> yeah, this is material that comes from one infalling clump, and that's. Uh, on a, s a certain orbit and drifting away from that clump. So th this just shows one of the larger subhalos in this simulation. 
out to its tile radius. And it looks like one of the clusters I've shown earlier. Like the, the cluster with a few million particles looks just like that. So you have, within the subhalos, you have subhalos again. So it's like, a, like one of these Russian dolls that you just make up. You open them and then you find another one inside. And now the, to quantify the abundance of subhalos and sub subhalos, I'll plot the number of structures above a certain peak circle velocity. And the black line gives everything that's within R200. And then these lines show stuff within 100 kiloparsecs and within 50 kiloparsecs. And it roughly follows a, a power law that goes like Vmax to minus three, which is this power law here. I say roughly because at the high mass end, that's not true. Uh, high, uh, high mass subhalos are transient, so they suffer dynamical friction. Their orbits decay. And if you have them or not, just depends on your recent accretion history. Sometimes you have them, sometimes not. Um, but here it's pretty close to that power law. And then here at about four kilometers per second, we fall below. But that's sort of also the scale where the systems are only resolved with a few hundred particles. So that's where we know that the simulation is starting to be limited by numerical effects. Uh, this minus three is interesting because if you look at uh, luminosity in the indirect detection signal, it's roughly, it's proportional to the scale density squared times the scale radius to third. And that turns out to be V max to the fourth power divided by R V max, which is just uh, V max to the the third power times the square root of the concentration parameter. So if you ignore this for now, this just ca cancels out and you could, would actually get the same contribution to the total luminosity per decade in subhalo size. Now taking into account the concentration, th this is actually becoming larger for the smaller systems because they form a bit earlier and are a bit more mm -hmm. concentrated. So this gives you even a slight, uh, slightly larger contribution to the total luminosity from small systems. So you really have to take into account all the CDM structures down to subsolar mass scales if you want to get the, the total signal from one halo. Um, the signal that we see down to about two kilometers per second sizes, that's not converged yet. So we, we see that the, so all the substructures contribute the ones we resolve contribute about as much as the smooth halo. But if we take into account that there would be smaller things and extrapolate this further down, we get boost factors of about a factor of 10. That means a CDM halo with substructure is about 10 times as luminous as a just a smooth halo of the same size. Okay. Um, now about the inset, that's uh, black is the similar line as here, but not going out to the or 200, but it goes out to the radius that encloses a thousand times the critical density. And the same is shown here for eight large subhalos. And these are all subhalos where the, this radius R1000 is smaller than the tidal radius. So these are structures that are within the tidal radius of subhalos. So these are sub subhalos. And so their relative abundance rescaled to the size of the host system is pretty comparable to the subhalo abundance within the host system. The main difference is just that uh, this turnoff is, this numerical turnoff happens earlier because we just have lower relative resolution in these systems. But overall it seems to be self similar. Yeah, that's what I, the CV is defined as the mean density within the peak. No, I mean, on the scale, we'll say V max, for example, or, or imperial mass, or whatever. Uh, it's very weak scaling with mass, so uh, it, it goes, it goes rough, roughly like minus 0.1 of the halo mass. If you take the real concentration, this concentration problem is a bit different, but it's, it's very, very weak. So over, over this range, there's little difference in, in, in this concentration. 
So now before I show you the density profile of the, of the host halo, of this VLF2 halo, I'll give some background about the density profile fitting functions that are usually used. So in the 90s, this function was, the NFW function was proposed to be the universal uh, density profile for CDM halos. So it's got an inner slope of minus one and at large radii it approaches minus three. And the scale radius just tells you where, the, where it's isothermal. And then later, so that was based on, on a relatively <laughs> large sample of galaxies and clusters, but simulated with, with only about, about a few ten thousands of particles. And the uh, important result here was that there's not much difference between clusters and galaxies. It's, it's close to universal. It's just the concentration, which is uh, goes into into here, into the, where the scale radius is relative to the virial radius. Just the concentration tends to be higher for galaxies. Otherwise, it's this universal form. Then later, uh, Ben Moore and others have simulated just one halo with very high resolution and found its density profile to be significantly steeper in the inner part. So they just modified it this slightly to be minus 1.5 in the inner run of the density instead of minus one. And they proposed this as a better fit. And so both functions are sort of universal. They just have a, a scale radius and a scale density as, as two free parameters. Um, so in, in my thesis, I looked at a large sample, well, medium-sized sample of well-resolved clusters. And it turned out that some clusters were really close to NFW and some were a bit steeper. And, but they're not perfectly universal. So that's shown here. If you rescale to the scale radius, this, and to the density within the scale radius, both of the forms shown before would be just overlapping. It would be just a line. Uh, when you plot the actual density profiles, you see significant scatter. So the, the black ones were my clusters, the black lines, and then I compiled other clusters from four other groups. The nice thing is they're scattered, but there's no, not much systematic difference between from one group to the other. So they've used very different codes, very different methods to set up the initial conditions. Uh, that's pretty robust. Also in the density slopes, you see scatter, but not much uh, difference from, so th the different groups agree very well. Just to make that point in a different way, if everything would be NFW, you would have a, a slope of 1.2 uh, at 3% of the peak circle velocity scale for all halos. But if you look at individual halos, the slopes scatter. And some of them are near the NFW value, some lower ones, and others are more like the, the Moore value. And it's still, well, first of all, it's still unclear what, what actually sets the density profiles. Why, why is everything close to NFW? And it's also unclear what, what actually causes this scatter. So there's, it's, really, it's, hard, it's a highly nonlinear problem, and there's no solution to really predict these things from first principle. So because there's some scatter, one, if, you want, if you want to get good fits to all these uh, profiles, you have to allow for a third free parameter which could be just this inner slope, which is done here, is replace it by a gamma, and s still have an out outer slope of minus three. Or you could also use a different form that asymptotes to a constant inner density, which is it's essentially a form that's been used a lot for elliptical galaxies. So it's the Sersich form, but now we use it, instead of in projection, we use it in 3D. And at this resolution, it's, it's actually unclear which one of the two is better. So they both fit very well, of course, much better than the two-parameter function, but it's unclear which one of these, like the cuspy one or the chord one, to prefer. <coughs> um, I also have to say that it's very hard to resolve these inner high-density regions, just numerically. 
um, what one does is one has individual time steps for all the particles. For particles in low density regions don't need very many time steps, so you can save CPU time there. But it's important to make enough time steps in high density regions. The empirical criterion for this adaptive time stepping is, is this. It depends on the square root of the force softening divided by the local acceleration at the position of the, that particle. The problem with this is it's, I mean, it's got the dimension of a time, but it's got little to do with the two dynamical time. And actually in a system that has a R2 minus one cost, that's just constant, because the acceleration is constant. Whereas the dynamical time, of course, still gets smaller in an R2 minus one cost towards the center. Um, if in, in this paper in 2005, we just added a simple switch where at high, in high density regions we forced the uh, time steps to be smaller and we actually found a difference. It makes a difference. It re really allows you to resolve higher densities in, in these galaxy clusters. And now we actually use uh, something that's really based on the dynamical time. So we, we've get, we got rid of this empirical uh, criterion altogether. And that was implemented by Marcel Sam about two years ago. And yes, he's, he's implemented an, an efficient algorithm to find the dynamical center for each particle and then calculate the dynamical time, so sort of the enclosed mass around this center. And that's the, what should set the, the, the local time step for, for a particle. And that's the, the, what we use now in the new second real Lactia run. So the density profile of the, of the real Lactia run is shown here. That doesn't show you very much. What you should look at is the residuals down here. So that's the blue one is the residual of a cusp B fitting function, where this inner slope gamma, the best fitting inner slope is here minus 1.24, whereas the red one is the Sersic profile, which has asymptotes to a core. And this one here, this scale here is the converged scale. So from convergence test, we expect the density to be correct within 10% at this radius. It, we don't trust the simulation further in. Um, here, it can be up to 10% too low, but it should be within 10% further out at larger radii. So the, the blue is really within the expected error here, and a very good fit out here, whereas the red one sort of is too shallow in, in the slope, so it, it compensates for that by going below, and then actually uh, it goes above the simulated densities and then below the simulated densities here. So the densities you get from these fitting functions are actually below the simulated densities, even at only 80 kiloparsecs, which is just where our forces become Newtonian, where our force, what our force resolution is. So at this scale, we, the simulation is almost certainly too low density and uh, so this fit is even lower than that. So we, that's some kind of hint that the, the cusp profile is a better approximation for, for, the, for the small scale. Of course, I should also say that uh, that's really just a bit of an academic question because in, in the real galaxy, this would be modified in an unknown way because galaxy formation either contracts the dark matter profile or if it's very clumpy, dynamical friction against baryonic structures could also expand the dark matter distribution. And it's really unknown at the moment which way this will go. So knowing the density profile of dark structures is re really just important for small subhalos that had no galaxy formation. And the subhalos, of course, they're not that well resolved, but so far, if we rescale them to RS and to the scale radius, they seem to be similar in the inner part with, with the same amount of scatter roughly, similar to the host halo. And they're of course modified by tidal interactions in the outer part, which makes them a bit steeper. Now we've used, we've, we've used the simulation to make predictions for GLOST, for what subhalos could be detectable in gamma rays. So again, we just have to to integrate over the density squared times the volume. And this is, uh, these are all sky maps for observers located at eight kiloparsecs from the galactic center. The one on the top are just direct summation over the structures that we resolve in the simulation. 
Here's including everything, and this is just including particles within subhalos. And the units are still arbitrary. This is just a density squared times volume. It's not, it's not photon flux yet, which will depend on particle physics. Then, since we know that we don't resolve all the structures, we correct for sub substructures by extrapolating the subhalo abundance to smaller scales and then adding that uh, part of the signal to the, to the subhalo signal, which of course makes the subhalos obviously brighter from here to here. But it also makes the background brighter, which is not shown here, but it, which is taken into account when we do the full analysis. So now the, the full analysis takes, takes this into account that there's uh, a lot of small scale structure that's unresolvable. There's very small scale structures within the subhalos. And then there's also the astrophysical foregrounds, which we take from the Galprop code. And now these plots show you the numbers of uh, subhalos that are detectable at five sigma significance with class after a two year integration. And as a function of the WIMP property, so that this is a function of mass using sort of the standard cross section. And this is a function uh, of cross section using the, I think 100 GeV mass. The different colors are different extrapolations. So I if we extrapolate down to a solar mass, you, you'd get the green color. And if we extrapolate all the way down to 10 to minus 12 solar masses, you get the red. You get more structures detectable here. It's not that the extrapolation adds new sources. It's not the small ones themselves that are detectable. But extrapolation does increase the boost factor due to sub-substructure. So that's why you get a larger number of detectable subhalos in the red case here. But in any case, these numbers are really interesting. There's just like a few tens to even a hundred clear detections at five sigma for glass. And this is only using the high energy photons, only the photons above three GeV, which is where, where glass has very good angular resolution. Of course, the significance of these detections will go up if you, if you take into account all of the, the wavelengths that the glass is, uh, is able to detect. Now, we can also probe the local dark matter distribution. So if you go all the way into eight kiloparsecs from the galactic center, we still have a s significant sample of subhalos at this scale. So you can measure the local number density. And you can also measure the concentration parameter of the local structures. It turns out to be, they turn out to be much more concentrated than structures in the field. And that's simply a tidal effect the tides tend to uh, take away the outer low density parts. So the scale radius and the density within the scale radius becomes much, much higher. So you have, relative to the dark matter, we have fewer systems in the inner part. That's also due to tides. But somewhat compensated by their, not fully compensated, but somewhat by their very, very high concentrations. And so if you take this and calculate how much annihilation signal do I get from all the clumps within a kiloparsecs, you get about 40% of what you get from the local smooth dark matter co uh, component on average. In a few unlikely cases, you can get a, a much higher number here. You can get about a, a factor of 10 in about 1% of the cases. I should have put that number on because I'm not, I think that that's about what it was. Okay, so these were sort of the redshift zero results. It's all based on the final output. Now I'll talk a little bit on, on, on how the system gets to this final state. And I'll compare with very simple uh, analytical models and ideas that have been around for a long time. So one of the models is the spherical radial top hat collapse. So that's a very simple model where you have a spherical over density that expands slightly slower than the universe and then here turns around and in principle would just go all the way to zero again. So it would be a completely radial collapse 
And so what one then does is one assumes that there's no kinetic energy at all at the turnaround time in this like homogeneous top hat over density. And then that the real theorem is fulfilled here, which just tells you that it has to collapse by exactly a factor of two from here to here. And then one says, at this time, this is the real radius of this perturbation. And you compa can compare the density within the real radius to the density, the cosmic density. And you'll see that the real radius has to enclose exactly 178 times the critical density in a matter-dominated universe. And it's slightly larger in the lambda CDM at redshift zero. So it's also redshift dependent in lambda CDM. So this is sort of widely used. These are very widely used scales based on these very simple uh, pictures, very simple ideas. Now, if you look at exactly this thing, of, uh, if you look at shells that enclose a fixed mass and how they evolve with time, uh, you see that the, the shell that actually encloses the real mass does not collapse by a factor of two, nowhere near a factor of two. I mean, it's, it, should, it should have gone up to 0.8 in 0.8 megaparsecs. So the, another difference is, of course, these shells contain a fixed mass, but they do not contain the same mass at all times. So, so the reality is very different, obviously, from the simple collapse model. Also, the, the predicted real radii seem to be somewhat at, at odds with, with reality. And in, in this paper by Prada and Klippin, they found that galaxies are in perfectly in equilibrium down to about, out to about two real radii. So much, much larger scales and much larger mass is actually realized than what the simple model suggests. That also means that mass accretion is not just plotting real mass versus time. If you do that, you, I mean, if you plot real mass versus time, you get this lower red curve here. Whereas if you, whereas the black lines show you the, how much mass is enclosed within, radi within fixed physical radii. And so the, the real mass just always grows by definition because the background density of the universe goes down. It even grows in time where everything is completely stationary. Everything is horizontal like here or like here. So this is not a very good description of accretion. So it's like in, in economic terms, it's you have nominal growth in the real mass during epochs where there's no real growth. It's like measuring uh, things in, in, dollar, in US dollars instead of real, real fixed quantities. So no major mergers are happening here though, right? I guess I mean, yeah. that's the reason why, the, why it's so flat. At yes, exactly. The ma exactly, that's the, the point I just wanted to make, that the mass really comes in in clumps. Um, you, you can pr practically account for all the final mass by adding up the masses of the progenitor clumps. And this 10% increase is just exactly due to one of the one mi minor merger that happened after this time. The last major merger was back here. So yeah, the halo has formed back here. And not much happens after that, except for this 10% uh, minor merger that brings in some mass. So since all has happened back here, why do we say that the mass increases by about a factor of two from here to here? I mean, I would say that the mass is pretty much constant from here to here. A better measure for the size of a halo would be the mass within the peak circle of velocity scale. So that's a scale that only goes up if there is major merger that really alter the physical mass distribution. So that's the blue one here. So that really goes up as long as there's physical mass accretion and merging. And that is pretty stationary, constant. There's this minor merger that adds a bit. And then it's constant again. But is the bound mass, though, I mean, because the bound mass is presumably or, or, you know, much more, or, or higher than this, right? Yeah, bound mass is more, it's more difficult. Right? Um, probably so everything, within, about, right? with, yeah, but everything yeah. within the turnaround radius is essentially bound. Dep but it depends on, the, on your environment. So, I mean, one point is often the same analytic models assume that, that this mass is somewhat proportional to the galaxy, the stellar mass, and this is everything just grows accordingly to this, but there's no real mass added to the system where, where the galaxy is. So that's, that's, not, that's the point. So you don't bring in any mass well, the dark matter during these times right. where, where the 
radial radius just grows. But the gas can make it down, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's yeah. another question. Yeah. That's possible. So now, there's, there's other models from a slightly later time, like from the mid 80s, where instead of stopping here, they follow these mass shells further. They allow them to go through the center and cross and fill back out. Um, this shows the time evolution of one mass shell in, <coughs> in fixed units. And it shows that the shell goes out to practically its turnaround radius, to 90% and slowly decays, but it reaches a pretty stable periodic orbit. If you plot it in terms of radius versus radial velocity, the individual shell falls in, it goes through the center, then comes back out here and does that several times. This is also a snapshot. So at, at each snapshot, at each time, you'd have mass shells populating all of these points on the lines. So if you integrate up at how much mass you have at one radius, you would get this sort of power law minus two-ish density profiles with these infinite density caustic spikes on top wherever the, there's turnaround where the mass shells pile up. Of course, we know that this is not the right density profile, but you can, you can fix that by adding angular momentum, so not everything has to go through the center and you, you would get some lower inner densities, more like the NFW profile. So now the question is, do we see anything like this? And of course, this, is, this would be some kind of border of the halo that and thus this pattern should be growing with time as the halo grows. So now let, let's memorize this pattern and look for something like, like this, in this in this movie. So this shows the, all the subhalos as they accrete and let's show it again. And then the different, different panels just split them up into things that just fell out falling for the first time and then they go into this panel for one for this orbit and then and, and so on. And there's also some symbols that sh just show some example systems that will end up on the third caustic. Let's just show it once more. So you really see these kind of growing patterns that <coughs> move towards the right. So these are just these like wave-like patterns. The material moves in a very different way. The material moves clockwise. And uh, here I have the same for the particles, just for all the particles together. And you again see some kind of patterns similar to the ones predicted in this model. But the difference to the model is, of course, that these, are, these patterns are not lines anymore. So there's dispersion in the radial velocity and there's also tangential dispersion, which you don't see in that plot. And if you integrate up the density, you don't see much at the positions of the caustics. It's like here, there's, there's kind of the third caustic is, is a visible one. You only see a weak bump in the total density profile. Uh, if you just look at the density of the slow material, you, get a, you see it better. But it's def there's definitely no high density caustics in from info. If you, from the same plot, it's clear that the radial velocity distribution is not going to be a Gaussian, so it, it depends a lot on where you look at it. If you look at a large radius, where the first caustic is, you see an infalling component, and then you see this near zero velocity first caustic component, that's of the first apocentric passage. If you look further in, you often see an infalling and an outgoing peak, which is often the superposition of several uh, populations. Uh, this is e even further in, that that's now centered on the third caustic, which is this peak here, and then again, a superposition of uh, three groups of infalling and two groups of outgoing stuff. And only the inner halo is really Gaussian in, in, this, in this picture. Of course, that doesn't exclude that there's a structure. I mean, I'm just saying that the, this, the inner halo is practically smooth in this, uh, in this radial velocity radius uh, diagram. 
in the full six-dimensional phase space, it's of course not smooth. There's substructures and stream, so, and maybe caustics in the, in the inner halo, like in the fine-grained distribution. But in, this, in, this, in the global uh, picture, there's just this weak uh, outer caustics in phase space, but not in density. Um, it's very challenging to detect something like this. So it's, it's not enough to see with lensing because the clumps themselves, the subvetos themselves, give you a larger signal. Uh, you would have to really be able to access the radial velocity too, to nail it down and look for it in, in the red curve, which is just stuff with low radial velocity. So the only possible way you can hope to detect it is in, in the galactic stellar halo, but it's extremely challenging. You'd need to be able to measure lots of radial velocities and um, distances pretty accurately uh, in the outer halo, like 200 kiloparsecs away. No, it's uh, because the, the, the infalling material is, is not a sheet in phase space. It's uh, That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, there's structures forming around the, the so it, there's not one structure in a homogeneous universe, right? There's, so it has tr transverse motion. Uh, well, but it's set up by the initial conditions. Yes, 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 see, yeah. Yeah, it's not, it, we've, We've looked at this in, in a million particle, one million to one billion, and it, it, it always shows up in, in, in these runs and qualitatively the same. It's but you could in principle go back and change your initial conditions and, and change the small scale structure that forms and see the difference. Yeah, yeah I, I, I could simulate uh, just one, per the, the model was just one perturbation. You know. I could simulate exactly. that and see if that's. Yeah. yeah, exactly. People have done, have simulated that. and. Even then, it does actually not happen because a system that's so radial is there's you're not going to have the radial orbit instability. So even then, it wouldn't follow the. So that comes in from the dynamics, not yeah. from the initial conditions. Yeah. So here, here, here it's the con initial conditions. You just have other structures that accelerate your infalling material into slightly different directions. Okay. Well, another thing to note is that this is uh, like the first caustic is at. 450, the second is at 310. This, that's both below, beyond what's typically considered the halo. It's, it's beyond the real radius. And, it, and the sort of typical fraction of your turnaround radius that the individual subhalo reaches is pretty close to what the model predicts, so around 90% for the first orbit and then somewhat smaller for the things that did a couple of orbits. Um, so that really means that the halo is more than just what's within the real radius. So a lot of the mass is actually found beyond the real radius. Um, that might be one of the reasons why the press Schechter mass function does not work very well, because it's predicting the abundance of halos. Um, then people look in simulations within this real radius and just compare the mass within the real radius to the predictions, usually. And that doesn't work out very well. So then people modified it and introduced, instead of a spherical collapse, they introduced an ellipsoidal collapse, which is, has three parameters. It's not closed closed system anymore. And then you can fit these parameters to the simulations. And now recently, this very interesting paper came out that actually, instead of just looking what's supposed to be the halo mass within the visual radius, they look at all the mass that's associated with, with galaxies. It doesn't make a much of a difference for large like clusters, but for galaxies, the masses are much larger. So if you compare the abundance predicted by press schechter to the, this, what they call static mass, it's just all the associated mass, press schechter actually fits pretty well. And so the, the, the difference between, if you just do the mass of the individual radius, you get something like the Shed and Tormund form. And so below M star, the difference is just that you don't count all the mass if you look within the real radius. So the probably not the, the ellipsoidal, uh, the spherical approximation was the, the limiting one, but it's just the mass doesn't go, doesn't stay where it's supposed to stay in this in this picture. Uh, so, oh, so um, how much time we have left? Not much. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just showed I just sort of work in progress on stellar halos and then I'll conclude. So 
once a star has formed, it just behaves like a collisionless dark matter particle. So we are now trying to add simple toy models to our simulations and tag the inner parts of halos as stars. And then, of course, we can compare the observations on Milky Way and M31. And stellar halos are also seen around nearby galaxies. The difference is in, in stellar halos, there's only a few hundred luminous building blocks that actually build up the stellar halo instead of hundreds of millions of dark matter halos that build up the dark halo. And because it's fewer blocks, you get more detectable streams. Because it's less of a mix, it's more of more, more, it's more, more visible structure, it's more clumpy. And then another difference is the light is typically only the very center, so you get denser, shorter streams. Um, typically the building blocks tend to fall in quite early, so the stellar halo ends up being much more concentrated and colder than the dark matter. Um, yeah, let's skip that. So the orbits, that's an example of an orbit in, in, in these triaxial potentials, they are, of course, not confined to planes. So that also means that the streams are quite complicated. So that's uh, an example from one accretion event, you can get this kind of streams in one projection. That's the same in another projection. This would be the stars. So that's what we call stars. It's the very inner part of the halo. And this would be the, the dark matter stream which is, of course, much more extended and much more messy. But even the stellar stream is, is a mess, right? It's not, it's not this like, nice, planar, roughly circular stream that people often have in mind. And now if we add all the accretion events together, you get something like this, a few surviving uh, dwarf galaxies. And the plan is, of course, to compare these to the observed dwarf galaxies and to compare the, the rest, the shredded debris from them to the stellar halo. And that's sort of work in progress. And I'll summarize here. So the, I'll show you that. So sub halos and host halos are pretty similar. They have cusp density profiles and similar amounts of substructure. Then for a typical WIMP class should be able to see a couple of sub halos. Um, the collapse is quite different from the simple top hat picture, that's why the real radius is not a good description of the bound mass. And what I sort of skipped over a bit is, well, I'll show it. So typical sub and particles are close to the realization at turnaround. So they turn around and fall in, and then they go back out to almost the same scale. So this factor of two collapse does not happen. So it's, it's close to the secondary info model, but without the caustics because of the, the scatter and the brightness. I'll stop here. It's not, it's not divergent, it's you get about equal contribution per decade in sub halo size, and that goes on till it, until about solar or slightly sub-solar mass scales. So you have to add in a couple of decades, but not, not an infinite number. Then at solar mass scales, what happens is that the power spectrum is so close to minus three that the concentration does not become higher anymore as you go to slow, even smaller systems. So the, Below solar, you get at most equal contributions. And then at some level, maybe 10 to minus 6 solar, or depending on the particle physics, at some level, it will be cut off. So it is really cut off by the very small scale stuff. If you have an, an exact uh, m to minus 2 mass function, if it's slightly shallower, like m to minus 1.95, then it's enough to go to about solar mass scales. And then below, you don't get much more because the concentration doesn't help you anymore to balance it out. <laughs>
No, I'm not sure because it's not going to be the only. Well, the, the most pronounced would you, you would get for the highest sigma, very early forming, yes, very first structure. structure. Yes, yes. That would be the best one, yes. Okay. Where, where there's no, practically no structure no, anywhere no, else, no, right? But this is the smallest one. Mm -hmm. And this smallest one is a complicated life in the host galaxy. Yes. So what is the most Uh, it's a very good question. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know. The question is, how significant is the contribution of those guys into um, annihilation uh, signal? Their defined structure or in phase space, how significant is the contribution of Yeah, I mean, in, if you just look at the very early time when it forms, it's possible that you get some enhancement from the caustic-like structures in the very first object. Um, then it's, un but it's really unclear how it will evolve all the way yeah, into it's the it's present it's halo. Right. So Yes, that's the cutoff we use, the physical one, okay. the free streaming one from the wind. Um, yeah, it's possible that on the smallest scale, in the most optimistic case where the caustics would all survive, there would actually be an, an additional boost from caustics, yes, right. from, not from unbound substructure. That's possible. It's very hard to, to, to say, uh, quantify at the moment. 